I may have forgotten some of this because I, <laughs> I wrote the book a long time ago. You know, I wrote it three years ago uh, and I probably wrote that part about four years ago. So though I have uh, carried on thinking about this, um, I, I may get some of the detail uh, wrong, <laughs> in which case I refer you to the book because it's much more likely to be accurate. So um, after the development of the uh, digital computer in the middle of the 1940s, which was then finally created after it was conceptualized by von Neumann, it was created. As I said uh, earlier, the initially that was seen as being like a brain, like a, a human or an animal brain. And although it very clearly became apparent that this was not the case, the parallels between the two systems, between the biological system and the uh, the artificial system were became very immediate, very immediately attractive to people. Uh, and because computers gave you, it appeared, even relatively primitive computers, gave you a way of trying to either mimic uh, thought processes or perception uh, or to test hypotheses for how different pathways might interact. And there was a very famous long meeting uh, at Dartmouth College in North America, at which the idea of artificial intelligence, the idea of trying to create programs that would in some way mimic aspects of natural human or even animal uh, intelligence, that became uh, a whole new area. That was a, an idea. It was kind of like a program that was set out by Minsky and others um, in this uh, in this very significant meeting that took place in 1956. And very soon people began to develop uh, programs that would, for example, be able to detect letters, uh, be able to identify letters, physical letters written on a well, they weren't written. They were huge, great big things. Uh, one of the most uh, well developed of these was a, a program called a perceptron. Uh, and this was able to reliably detect letters that were about, you know, 50 centimeters high. So you had a camera that would then uh, see or detect the image and would reliably say that's an A, that's a B. Now, all this seems trivial these days. Uh, when you can now get, uh, for example, a pretty good um, computer translation of a text. If you've got a text, you put it into Google and it will come up with something that isn't perfect by any means and may be completely wrong in some places, but it's not bad. Um, and this is so the idea of, well, how how difficult is it to reliably detect the letter A uh, seems a bit hard to understand. But in fact, the processes that were developed by the perceptron uh, in the early years of the 1960s and by that whole approach to uh, computing are the same that underlie the ideas uh, of Google's uh, DeepMind and all the now uh, widespread applications of uh, artificial intelligence, which are becoming uh, increasingly prevalent down to, as a biologist, one of the most extraordinary develops, uh, developments over the last year um, has been what's called AlphaFold. And this is a, a program that has learned rules because that's what these, these machines do. They don't understand anything. They learn rules uh, from simply looking at lots and lots of examples. And AlphaFold is able to predict with a reasonable degree of accuracy from an amino acid sequence, that is the sequence of uh, amino acids that are produced by a gene, what the three-dimensional structure of a protein uh, is. Because an amino, amino acids aren't just in a chain, they actually then form these three-dimensional structures which are very difficult for us as humans to predict. And it's been a uh, an imponderable pro problem since the middle of the 1950s, the relationship between this sequence that you can see ultimately in your DNA and the three-dimensional form that the protein eventually takes. Now, what 
these um, what these uh, programs were able to do, it, even let, detecting a letter A, was that you had interconnections between feature detectors, so they would detect uh, little dots or lines, and if you told it, well, you've got, you know, if it if it kind of picks out a a set of uh, uh, a set of dots and it says, well, is that an A? And you say, yes, it is an A. Then it goes back and it uses that information to refine its estimation and it gets better and better, much as the same as you would do if you were told, you know, um, if you're doing playing the piano and you're learning to play uh, a, a, a tune on the piano, you make a mistake. Somebody says, no, that's not right. You mustn't press that key, you must press that key. You go back and you do it again and you can improve your performance. And these programs, by their interaction in what's called the hidden layer, sometimes called the middle layer. So you've got your, your input, which is a, a set of sensors, light sensors in the case of simply detecting a single letter. And then you've got an output, which is its decision as to what it thinks it's seen. And if you help it by saying, oh, that's right or wrong, then it can go back and increase its performance by strengthening certain pathways. So this can produce uh, quite dramatic. I mean, even for the 1960s, this was seen as revolutionary. And the idea was, well, we'd have what's called generalized artificial intelligence. So, you know, a machine that can think like we can. Uh, there's nothing like that on the horizon, uh, and I, I don't think there will be for a very long time, but this is a big disputed area. Um, so these very, very simple programs, by our standards, were very dramatic in terms of suggesting perhaps how uh, this process of learning and of ultimately of perception could take place. The problem is the middle bit <laughs> is opaque to us. So we don't understand, you, you set up a machine, you say, okay, effectively you, a bit like an animal, you reward it for performing in a particular way. Uh, so if you think about circus animals that will behave in a, uh, you know, they will perform tricks, they will balance balls on their noses or whatever, they will perform dances, you know, that has all been done by reinforcing, by when they do something that is very close to that, the desired endpoint, which we desire, they are rewarded, hopefully by food rather than by a shock. So it's more likely to be positive reinforcement. It's called a negative reinforcement. This works in a very trivial way. I mean, I, I remember when I was a student, we had uh, practical classes of all kinds, and the best practical class, the most insightful one uh, I, I did was uh, on a rat. Now, one of the main ways you study or studied in the past, anyway, rat behavior and rat learning was you had what's called a Skinner box. B.F. Skinner was a very famous psychologist. So you've got a box and in it there will be uh, two bars and two lights, a light above each bar and a little food hopper. And you get your rat, which is hungry. You've got to make sure it's actually lost a bit of weight. So you, you imagine how we feel when we're hungry. So the animal is, is it wants to get food and you give it these tiny little pellets of, uh, of food. And when you first put a naive rat, so this is a rat that's never been in one of these boxes before, but it is hungry. You put it in the box and this is us as students. We're watching this rat in a box and you it, it doesn't know anything about bars about press leaning up and pressing on leaves it doesn't know anything at all because it's naive and you gradually what's called shape it so when it moves to if you want it to press the right hand bar when the light above the bar is on then the first thing you've got to do is to get it to go over to the right hand side of the cage and so as soon as it makes the slightest movement towards the right hand side of the cage you press a button and Pop, a little tiny little bit of food comes down the hopper and the rat eats that because it's hungry. It can smell it's there. And it then goes back to where it was because last time it was there, it got some food. And then you don't feed it when it's there. You've got to get it a bit further over and then a bit further over. Then gradually you in make the criteria more and more stringent for what you want it to do. And so in the end, it's only getting food when it presses the bar, when the light's on. 
And this can take a few hours, but the rat is very smart and above all, it is very, very hungry. And you end up with this behavior that you wanted to, uh, you want to study. And then you can manipulate that in all sorts of ways. The point I'm making is that from uh, all we know is we've got the input, which is the rat's behavior, where the rat is, and the output, which is where we end up with this particular behavior. What's going on in the rat's head? We've no idea. We don't know what's happening. So there's a very interesting similarity between our, uh, certainly in the 1960s, when both kinds of work, both the perceptron and this kind of shaping work was uh, being done, between the our ignorance of the middle air, it literally is a black box. This is what B.F. Skinner was somebody who wasn't actually interested in the brain at all. He was simply interested in the behaviours and trying to see how they could be uh, altered and what rules might underlie that, those alterations. So there was a strong parallel, but it was a parallel of mystery <laughs> between the how these computer programs seem, seem to work in being able to identify um, different letters or whatever, and how uh, animals, you could teach them very simple things without actually knowing anything about what was going on inside them. Uh, or, or, you know, without you don't know anything, you could imagine that it's all to do with strengthening of synapses. And indeed, it almost certainly is. Uh, but, you you know, you don't need to know that and you can't prove it from that kind of study. So this kind of went on and there were uh, mm -hmm. finally there was a, a big argument in the AI community about the validity of these approaches and how much they could tell us. And. Uh, what it ended up with was a big collapse of confidence at the beginning of the 1970s, end of the 1960s, where more sophisticated arguments about, well, we, we really need to understand what's going on here. And there doesn't seem to be any way of getting to grips with the processes and trying to understand them and then model them uh, in the, either the machine, in the machines. And this led to a collapse of interest in the in this particular, in this in the area of perceptrons in particular, this this input and output uh, approach, it finally started to redevelop in the 1980s. When and it, clearly, if you've got a computer and you're trying to come up with a, models of intelligence or behaviour or something, you, you're partly limited by computer power. So if you've got a very dim computer that can't do very much and, you know, is the size of a room and has got whatever, you know, 8K of memory or so, you know, who knows, you know, less, you know, it's got virtually no memory and may, may be made of valves, not even of um, solid state uh, uh, transistors, then you've clearly got a problem. You can only go so far. And it was partly developments in technology, computer technology with Moore's law, with the increasing rapidly uh, exponential increase in density of uh, processes, with the development of transistors, then printed circuits and so on, that led to this revival of interest in the 1980s with what's called PDP, um, parallel, I forgot what, this is, what it means. Anyway, uh, but it basically- the Parallel dis distribution computing, parallel yeah. distributed processing. Yeah. Uh, and this is basically a souped up version of the perceptron. It's very, very similar. And you've got the same issue with this middle layer and you're not quite sure what's going on. But it meant that more sophisticated things like programs that could apparently generalize language rules. So one of the intriguing things when you're learning a language uh, as a child is you have to extract rules from what you're learning. I mean, this is all done below the level of consciousness. Um, so instead of saying uh, for Go, for example, in English, the past participle of Go should be, if it was behaving itself like, I don't know, I try, then you say, I tried. That's the past, past participle. So if you say, I go, you should say, I goed, but that's wrong. <laughs> so it's it, the in, in, in English, it would be, I went. So there's a different, it's an irregular verb, but the child is clearly trying to learn how to um, how to understand language. And so it makes these mistakes. And what's interesting is that some of these programs made the same mistakes. So in a way, making mistakes is good there because it shows that you've extracted a rule rather than you've simply learned the particular past participle. 
and you know that it's went. I mean, if the, if the, if the programmer got it, the computer program got this learning and this language manipulation right first time, you'd be less impressed because it just it would be a, a very specific kind of um, association between the uh, the two participles, you know, present and past. Whereas a learning and applying a general rule, now that's interesting because that's in general what learning involves. It's not a particular thing. You have to then, as with language, you have to nuance once you've got the OK, in, in, in English, you put ED on the end of a verb and it becomes a past participle. Then you've got to nuance all that with the various other kinds uh, you know, of irregular verbs. And all languages have this mixture of regularity and then irritating irregularity that as a foreign language speaker, you've got to remember because it doesn't make sense. Um, so in the 1980s, this started to become much more... Um, much more powerful and there were clearly real steps being made. But again, the lack of computing power, the lack of progress in the field led to a, uh, a second um, winter, as it's been called. So after the first, the collapse of the perceptrons led to a, a reduction in funding, in particular in the USA, in particular from the military, who'd been very interested by the perceptron. They'd funded the perceptron because they thought they could develop uh, you know, machines that could think, that could think in, in a similar way to a, a human being, or simply identify things. If you, th if you think of our modern world, I mean, I've just been watching you know, horrendous images from, uh, from Ukraine where uh, you can see robot system, robotic systems guiding uh, missiles to kill people with remarkable degrees of effectiveness. You know, the processing that's going on there in terms of recognizing a target, latching onto it and then guiding a missile to hit the tank or the city or whatever it is, um, is uh, really quite remarkable compared to these struggles 60 years ago to be able to identify a great big letter uh, projected on, on a wall that isn't moving, that's static, that's black and white and highly contrasted and is just a letter. So. We have come an amazing long way in the ability of these systems to process in real time. And you're getting somewhere, uh, and in some respects is even greater than the ability of a human being to be able to identify um, a particular thing as it moves and to locate it and so on. And scientists increasingly who aren't interested in AI will use such systems to uh, track the animals that they're studying, for example, you'll build a little program that can identify an individual and then we'll track it and provide you with a, a readout of where the animal's been moving in three, three dimensions. So, and all these systems can trace their pathway back to the early perceptrons and this idea of there being this three levels with the really interesting stuff happening in the, in the middle layer. And this is what eventually Google, uh, having bought up uh, a series of startups ended up doing uh, in the late, uh, in about 2008 onwards uh, in, in, in the USA, able to, in particular through the work of Jeffrey Hinton, uh, who has been around for, for decades. He's a longstanding researcher in the AI community. And he was able to develop these uh, to really quite remarkable degrees. And one of the most striking uh, examples that you, you get of this is because these, these devices simply looking for patterns. They're looking for patterns, repetitions. And if you say, that's all you say to them, you say, right, what you effectively, they're being rewarded. They're not actually being rewarded. I mean, they don't get, they don't get a little bit of food or a little jolt of electricity. <laughs> they probably like the electricity, but they are, um, they're simply being, they are told if you find a pattern, then look for it again, find something similar. And they can do this just over and over again because we've got you know, incredibly powerful computers these days. And one of the examples is that Hinton set up one of these programs and gave it, I can't remember how many hours, hundreds, thousands of hours of YouTube videos to watch. And this was uh, in the noughties when YouTube wasn't full of, you know, climate change deniers and crazed vaxxers and unboxers, <laughs> people showing their toys or whatever. Um, it was a purer time. You could read the comments. And he their, their program wasn't told to look for anything. It was just given a load of YouTube videos to watch. Now, of course, it's not actually watching videos at all. 
Yeah, you haven't got a, a, a glowing red eye like in 2001, A Space Odyssey, staring at a screen and re watching things. What you've got is a computer program that is reading zeros and ones, because that's ultimately what YouTube is. So it's just looking at these patterns of zeros and ones. And after many, many hours of processing these images, or these series of zeros and ones, it came out with uh, something it could recognize with a reasonable degree of reliability. And that was a cat. Because in those days, YouTube was full of cat videos. It's not anymore, but you know. Um, <laughs> and so all it was doing was picking up these uh, I mean, they, they had in the end, they made a it was kind of a bit like a platonic image of a cat that this thing could recognize. And you can see if you squint your eyes, you can see clearly it's got two ears and uh, uh, an eyes and, uh, you know, it's got the face of a cat. And that's what this device had a, it just recognized by looking for hours and hours at YouTube videos. And when Hinton was asked, well, how does it do it? <laughs> he said, we've no idea. So we're back to the same problem. This is what underlies all of the examples of um, uh, deep learning that people get very excited about and clearly is incredibly powerful and may well have possibilities for uh, medicine, for detecting uh, particular uh, diseases in x-rays or whatever, or indeed in more pure scientific approaches for um, uh, identifying proteins or to be more alarming for identifying you or me when we walk through an airport because it can, oh, I recognize that face, that orientation. I mean, that's basically how you, well, it's not entirely. Um, your iPhone, if it, you're doing face recognition, is not using the same technique. It's actually taking physical measures of your face. Uh, so it's basically just another version of your fingerprint. But underlying that and, uh, you know, it more in, more worryingly is the possibility of this, these systems being used to identify individuals, particular racial groups, and so on. But what they aren't doing, I don't think anybody now really thinks, is telling us anything about how the brain works. <laughs> so there's a, they've, they've gone down this route, which is immensely productive and powerful and obviously commercially interesting, but I'm not sure that many people these days really think this is telling us about how the brain works. Uh, and that what humans can do is completely different. And you can see this, I think I said this last time, in the images that uh, DAL-E, uh, this new deep learning program that will create, basically it just has got lots and lots of images from all over the internet, and then will create things. So if you give it a prompt, uh, it will then produce a beautiful picture of whatever you've just asked it to. So, for example, if you ask it to say, give me a picture of an astronaut riding a horse, then it will produce a picture of an astronaut riding a horse. You know, and you can ask it what an astronaut riding a horse drawn by Van Gogh, then it will produce it in the style of Vincent Van Gogh. So it's astonishingly powerful. But of course, it understands nothing. Because if you say to it, it's the problem of called super, superposition. It doesn't understand the, the phrases you've given it. If you say to it, draw me a picture of a horse riding an astronaut. Now, a four-year-old will understand immediately what you're saying. will probably laugh because it thinks it's funny. And will try and draw you a picture of a horse riding an astronaut. These devices don't even try. They will have an astronaut. They will have a horse. But they don't actually understand what riding means. So there's no, there's no, because there's no understanding, this is simply looking at correlations on a massive scale, incredibly quickly, amazingly powerfully, but devoid of meaning. And without meaning, well, you haven't got a brain because even the simplest brains, you know, a worm is assigning what's called valence. So a quality to the perceptions it receives. Is this nice? Is it nasty? To be very crude. I mean, that's the simplest dimension you've got. Do I, do I approach it or do I go away? From it? Every perception is not simply a value. It's not a zero or a one. But because we are evolved animals, we're adapted to respond in particular ways. Even the simplest of st stimuli have those valences. They have a meaning. Oh. 
And that's what's completely absent at the moment from all these programs. So the, there's been this kind of apparent parallel, but I think in fact they've completely separated. So you, you use the word understanding too many times. Okay, so let me... Uh... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's a good thing because I, that is what my next question is going to be about. So there are these, uh, at the risk of oversimplification, there are these two approaches in AI. One is called the symbol-based or the rule-based AI, and one is called the network-based, roughly what you have been explaining. Yeah. So the rule-based the rule -based or the symbol-based ones looks at the higher mental cognition and tries to come up with theories and models of how it works. The network-based approach just looks at connections and just gives data, looks at the output, and just then, I mean, what happened? But like you said, now what happens in the middle layer? Uh, layer they are not content with. So, how 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 do you think? How much do you think the brain works on the symbol-based approach, and how much is it works on the network-based <laughs> approach? Well, I think it's both, but I think the you know the the the. I mean, th there have been attempts to test this. So, I mean, it's very tempting to look at these middle layers and to think, well, maybe that's how um, some parts of our brain work. And this has been attempted by a fascinating fusion of neuroscience and computation, computational approaches uh, on the system that I've been working on for most of my life. That is Drosophila, the fruit fly. And in particular, a part of its brain where and this is common to all insect brains, where associations are made between uh, uh, olfactory stimuli, smells, and meaning, and valence. And this is an area called the mushroom body. And basically, it's got a kind of crisscross structure of neurons that is quite similar to what we think is happening in this middle layer, where you've got these interactions between uh, all the various inputs and you've got this you know feed forward from your result to say this is right or this is wrong you know have another go so there's an anatomical similarity and attempts have been made to say well is this actually a functional similarity is this how a fly learns the meaning of smells that it doesn't that aren't hardwired because obviously some smells are for animals for flies and for us are hardwired, they mean a particular thing, but other smells are just in the environment and you can, like my rat learning that it will get fed if it goes over on that side of the cage, the smell, the fly can learn uh, that smell is associated with something nice, that smell is associated with something nasty. And although it hasn't been completely um, proven, the results are quite uh, intriguing and do tend to suggest that at least parts of the brain are I've got this plasticity that may be functioning in a similar way or along similar lines to uh, the kind of network systems I've been describing. But there are other parts of the brain which are, for a start, much more distributed, any brain. Uh, I mean, this is part of the general problem of, I think I talked about last time, between localization and distribution, uh, which continues to dog us. Um, but the key point, I think, is that there is function and meaning inbuilt into the develop into the developed nervous system. That's 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 what it does. So it has it has meaning there, um, uh, and that meaning is not um, that that meaning is associated with an evolutionary past. It's been shaped by that, and with an evolutionary and developmental pre present. So. That also explains why there are individual differences, that even a wor two worms that are, have apparently identical wiring diagrams, so then they have the same set of neurons that are wired up in the same way, they, they may have different strengths of connections. So it's not just a, a digital thing, there's a, an analog aspect. Certain connections may be stronger in one individual than an, in another, producing differences, individual differences in behavior. So you've got a, a, a mixture of uh, you know, meaning and uh, function and this complex distributed and interactive way, network way of, of functioning. My guess is that different parts of the brain, or to the extent that they exist, and it's not all just one distributed mess, um, 
will tend, some parts of the brain are going to be more likely to show this kind of network effect than others. And the kind of system I've described, like in the insect mushroom body, as it's called, because it looks, it doesn't really look like a mushroom, uh, but that's what it's called. Uh, that may have this kind of, uh, of underlying principle, but that's a developmental one. You can see just like the networks are developing. You start off with a particular set of interactions, you re reinforce them, you reward them, you tell them what they got right, goes round and round and round, and then you end up with a, after many millions of iterations, you end up with a particular output. It's the same with us and, and learning, and that's what we think is happening in, in the mushroom body, that certain connections are being strengthened and others weakened as a consequence of behavioral interactions. Uh, sir, uh, can we discuss Sir's Chinese room experiment to get into the understanding part? Oh, not not really. I'm not I'm not a philosopher. <laughs> okay. So I mean, I, it would be a. I'm, I I suspect you could do it a lot better than me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so as I if I if I can recall very, I mean, it's a similar kind of problem. So if I recall correctly, what John Searle, what Searle said is that if you've I mean if you've got a uh, I can frame the. I can frame said, the question. You said, I can't remember it. <laughs> but he said that suppose there is a room in which there is a person, or uh, there is a computer program, and it the from some portion pages and pages of Chinese manuscripts are given to it, and it learns the. Uh, I mean, it learns this word stands for this. This word stands for this, and it learns all the rules of Chinese, and you give it a. Uh, you give it a paper in Chinese and it gives you the pack translation in English. Would you say that the, the that the program understands English? Yeah. So this, this is the, the the paradox. I mean, I I I would say no. I mean, because I'm 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 not a I'm a psychologist or I'm interested in meaning, uh, so valence, uh, and I think understanding involves all those things. It's not simply a mechanical process. Uh, I mean, and, and, and partly this is now we've moved on because we're nearly there. We're nearly with uh, Searle's room. We're, as I said, we're not quite because, you know, Google translation is still not, you know, if you know the two languages, you know that it's wrong. On the other hand, if you just want to know what somebody's tweeted, then press the translate button on a tweet and whatever language it was in, you've now got an idea of what was said. So we're getting towards Searle's vision. but. The machines are simply very good pattern recognition. I mean, that's all it is. And they, you know, you've still got a problem. If you say something, so when I was a student, computers were awful at translation. I mean, it was ridiculous. And there was a widespread belief that it would <coughs> never be possible outside of an actual intelligence. And clearly that's not right because, you know, there's no evidence that any of the computers we have are in any way conscious or doing anything other than a mechanical process. And yet they can produce uh, these quite dramatic uh, performances. And one of the uh, but one of the examples we used to give uh, in those days of the problems that computers would have in understanding and being able to properly translate is still real. I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. So. Uh, time flies like an arrow. OK, so this is a very uh, strong English uh, saying, and it involves a metaphor. Time flies like an arrow. And then fruit flies like a banana. <laughs> so and the computer won't understand. It won't understand, you know, it won't be able to pass, as they say in grammatical studies they won't be able to understand the link between i mean it's a joke as well you know it's not it's not simply a a way of trying to uh, ask a computer to you know calculate the square root of minus one and it will then explode or whatever you know um it's a way of uh showing that language has got this in deep rooted structure within it it's not simply a set of correlations because those correlations uh sometimes break down the words can mean Diff completely different things in different contexts. Flies in one context means uh, is a verb. In another, it's a plural noun. You know, time flies is time flying. A fruit fly is Drosophila, so fruit flies. But also fruit flies. So banana is a fruit. 
So the computer is going to get very confused, whereas a human can understand this instantly. And we have exactly the same things with, and this is the same kind of problem as it, it's just a bit more sophisticated version of a, a horse riding an astronaut, where you know all you've done then is you just turn two words round and the machine has got no idea what you're talking about. If you gave it bazillions of pictures of a horse riding an astronaut and those words, that prompt, it would it would come back no problem because it's, it's not stupid. I mean, it can see there's a link. But if you take the meaning out of that and change it round, then the machine is completely lost. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think Searle's uh, it's not understanding it in any way that I think is useful. <laughs> That's what I would say. It's, it, it is, I think if you say that whatever's happening in that Chinese room is understanding, then I think we're, the word has lost its meaning. It doesn't have, you, we will have to invent another word <laughs> that mm. means that has got that valence uh, and that deep structure within it and not simply a set of correlations which is all these programs are able to identify. And even in that, of course, in identifying patterns, there's still some things that computers are rubbish at. You know, there's, um, there's that whole, uh, that whole, now it's become a, 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 an ecosystem called Zooniverse, where people, scientists, have got images that the computers can't detect. It started off with images of galaxies because they had bazillions of images of galaxies and they wanted to identify and classify the different kinds of galaxies and find the odd ones out. And they could give these to computers and the computers were rubbish at it. Whereas people could immediately say, ah, that's like that and that's like that very, very quickly. So uh, any, any, any listeners or viewers who fancy spending some time, you can identify all sorts of stuff, handwriting, uh, images on things on Mars, galaxies i mean it's all sorts of academic for uh, people now use this to get humans en masse large numbers of us to process images in ways that are much more effective than computers so even the computer has a problem with seeing some things should i go with the next question yeah 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 so sir uh, doesn't uh, if most of the fo current uh, focus of ai is on these network based approaches and uh, look altogether overlooking these other approaches then isn't it a hopeless task if the goal initially at least the goal initially of artificial intelligence was to understand the human mind <laughs> well i would say so yes i don't think that i wouldn't start from there you know um but Clearly, I mean, I'm not an expert in this field, right? So I have a, I have views, you know, I'm allowed to, but I am I am not an expert. I've never published in the area. I've simply read the material um, and I have my own prejudices. So I'd have to uh, preface it, all that I say with that. And I, I don't want to be rude about anybody's work um, because, you know, I'm not an, I, I'm not involved in this community. I don't I, I I'm not involved in any of the struggles that take place. I simply observe them. Um, yeah, I, I think that's right. And I don't I think if you said if Jeffrey Hinton were here, he would say, yeah, but that's not my objective. I'm not interested in that. Uh, if it casts light on the human mind, then fine. But that's not what I want to do. I want to develop systems that can identify uh, patterns that can perform in a human like way as much as possible, uh, whether it's speaking to uh, other individuals or whether it's recognizing images or, or whatever it is, um, I want to develop these specialized systems. And I think you've got to remember that's what we're talking about. We're talking about specialized systems, you know. Uh, Hinton, Hinton's cat detector, if you give it an image of an X-ray of cancer, it's going to be hopeless. And similarly, the, the, the system that's been trained on the X-ray images of cancers, if you give it a cat, it's just going to, fall over. So these are very, very specialized systems that have been trained because of the way, like my rat, that it's only any good in that cage with that, you know, if I change that system, if I make the light a different color, the rat won't be able to press the bar anymore. It won't do it because it's been trained to do one particular task. And these machines in far, far more complex ways have similarly been trained to do one particular task. And there you immediately can see the difference between what the computer's doing and what 
any dim animal is doing you know it's not the same thing what an, a nervous system can do is far far more flexible uh, and in a you know as i say even the 300 odd neurons of a worm which has barely got i know it's got a brain i mean it's got a few neurons together at the front eight or something you know so it's nothing and yet it can navigate it can move it can respond to the environment it can learn uh it can do you know multiple things that are, any of these computer programs are incapable of doing even those those programs have far far more many far far more components than the worm so the difference isn't in some vitalist ah where well, one's alive and the other's dead it's not about some spirit in the in, in the worm but it's about the the multiple layers of uh, communication between those neurons and the multiple layers of meaning of the significance of the valence of of stimuli that are you know built into it through evolution so uh, you know these computers are, are very very good and very very quickly get to uh, you know, identifying an image that you want them to identify but you've got to remember that all the animals we've seen about us you know the, the brain has been about well it's a bit of an argument about how long we've had a brain uh, but let's say a billion years, roughly. You know, a, a brain is as complicated as a, a C. elegans, so you know, a few neurons together. Maybe a billion years, and many, many generations within each of those years. For many of the organisms, not for us, obviously, but for the the smaller organisms, many, many generations. And that has what goes as in each of the many, many lineages of animals we've got, they all share both the initial uh, interactivity between cells, but then the process of natural selection of you know, sifting between variants to meet particular environmental pressures with all the time, I mean, being absolutely literally vital to be able to respond in the right way to that. If the animal doesn't respond in a, an adaptive way, it's gonna die. So you've got a very, very strong selection pressure, which is a selection pressure for function and for plasticity. And that's very, very different to the kind of systems. You know, it's a scale of complexity, of evolutionary and developmental depth, which is far, far greater than any artificial system we currently have. So I think in a way it's, you know, in a way it's not surprising. It is surprising at one level. You know, these things are really stupid, these worms. They've only got 300 cells. And yet, in some, from many points of view, they can outperform our most powerful computers. They can do much more interesting things, much more complex and flexible things. But when you remember that it's not just that worm and that worm has got, you know, a billion years of brain evolution and even, you know, three billion years of, straightforward evolution behind it because single cell organisms can do very clever things as well um then it's not perhaps not quite so surprising but that's as i say that's nothing to do with vitalism or any spirit or anything like that it i mean it's all understandable ultimately i just don't, i think we're a long way off from getting to that understanding so, sir, are you trying to say that meaning emerged at a particular point in the evolutionary history and there is no, an no, evolutionary no, no, no. roadblock? No, no, meaning, meaning's always been there. Uh, I mean, because, you know, an, a, a bacterium which will move about, will move, uh, I mean, so I work on the sense of smell. And the sense of smell, although it works in very different ways in animals from bacteria, bacteria will still detect chemical gradients in the medium in the, in the liquid in which they, they 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 exist and they will move along those gradients and that will have emerged as the very earliest form of responding to the environment and those stimuli you know salt whatever it might be they have meaning they have valence they are the, if you move one way you will survive if you move another way you won't survive and so you've got these selection pressures which are meaning that is what meaning is what valence for sensory stimuli is coming from that is that is their nature if you, you know, put it another way if you if you see a tiger and you don't run away you're not going to last very long and that's a very strong selection pressure well it's the same ultimately for your bacterium and a salt iron if it doesn't respond in the right way to salt or whatever 
it will either it may die. So the, the way that we the organisms, you know, meaning or valence, if you prefer, and perception and processing and producing a response to that uh, stimulation are all part of the same thing. They're all mixed up. It's all to do with, you know, that, that that's what organisms do. They respond to the even the simplest ones without neurons, with single cells in very, very simple ways are responding to uh, the outside world and trying to maximize their uh, fitness, their survival and their ability to pass their genes on to the next generation. And your computer's not doing that. And maybe it's just as well because they'd stopped. Maybe, you know, if they basically all I'm saying is they're not alive, right? But that's not to do with vitalism. It's to do with the nature of life and this multiple layer of information within an organism from its genes through to the way its proteins are organized through to its behavior. So vitalism means there's some, I mean, there's some spirit that is something unique about uh, and, and living beings. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, there is a problem. Don't get me wrong. So, scientists don't generally interest themselves about what <laughs> worrying about what is life. Philosophers do. Scientists, I mean, you know, no biologist is um, uh, is going to worry about that, which is very strange because it's fundamental to our, uh, our our knowledge as scientists, and yet we don't worry about what it is. We might get involved in arguments in the pub about are viruses alive, for example. That's the classic one. Uh, I don't think they are. Uh, they're just replicating bits of nucleic acid. Um, but there are some people who think, well, they are a form of life. But part of the issue, of course, is we're all made of the same stuff. You, me, a rock. And yet we can have this conversation and the rock is just going to sit there. It's not going to do anything. So there's clearly something about the way our atoms are organized, which enables us to do this, but which prevents the rock from doing anything other than just sitting there on the floor. And for many centuries, millennia, uh, that was, people argued that there was some kind of vital spirit. And even up until the uh, early years of the 20th century, there was a lot of interest in this kind of explanation, which appears to explain something, but in fact doesn't, because unless you can boil this stuff down, unless you can identify what it is, you're no further on. You haven't actually explained anything. Um, and eventually, I think largely, but not entirely, that has been left to one side. People uh, don't, don't, scientists don't think in that way. The, the, the great French astronomer Laplace uh, showed, um, was it Napoleon? I can't remember. Uh, I think it was Napoleon. His map of the universe or his, his model of how the universe worked, which was kind of a souped up version of New Newton's ideas. And uh, Napoleon or whoever it was said, well, where is God in your clockwork universe? And Laplace replied, I have no need of that hypothesis, which I think is where we generally are now with vitalism. We, it's not necessary. On the other hand, we still can't create life. We can't make life in it out of its constituent molecules. We can't turn a set of carbon and phosphate and all the rest of it into a living thing yet. Um, but ultimately, uh, we will be able to because it did happen once in a laboratory or not in a laboratory, but in a deep, probably in a, a in the deep sea three and a bit billion years ago where non-life became living. So that's the that what, what I'm trying to get at in terms of the ability of uh, organisms to respond. And this is all organisms, as I say, bacteria, it's plants. You know, you can think of plants turning towards the light um, or even more dramatically, Venus fly traps, carnivorous plants, trapping animals and so on, showing quite rapid movements. This is all to do with meaning, stimuli and responses and meaning all being wrapped up in this process of natural selection and, and adaptation. So two questions. Uh, one, uh, without the hypothesis of vitalism, doesn't the problem of life become much more intractable? It seems like it's... Well, I don't think vitalism helps you. It just, uh, I mean, it's, you know, as I think we can explain 
the origin of, if you want to talk about the origin of life, then we have the beginnings of a model. Now we know we can, in the laboratory, RNA, uh, which is, you know, if you want half of DNA, it's not quite as simple as that, but RNA is got a single strand of nucleic acid that can copy itself. If you give it the component parts and put it into a, uh, a, a mini cell, effectively, a tiny uh, vesicle, a fat bubble, like uh, if you had the mRNA vaccine, uh, which I've had three doses of now, uh, then that's how it's delivered. You get this tiny ball of fat and in it you've got messenger RNA. Well, if you put an RNA molecule and the component parts of an RNA molecule into one of these tiny little balls of fat, and the reason you want to put it in there is because it's so small, the molecules can actually meet each other because molecules are unimaginably tiny. <laughs> and so if you just put them in a test tube, they never bump into each other. But if you put them in to those uh, little vesicles, then you can get replication of RNA. So you're getting copying of one molecule into another. Uh, and that that's that's similar to what crystals do in a way. But it's different. It's much more complicated. These RNA molecules can be much longer. And above all, they can act on the outside world. They can change other chemicals. They can alter. Uh, they, they act as enzymes. In fact, RNA is a, wow. also an enzyme. So it can actually alter physiology. Well, not the physiology. It can alter the chemical makeup yeah. of the inside of this kind of protocell. Now, all this is done by us putting all the stuff in there. So we've created, you know, we haven't actually created anything. We just put the bits together. And then these spontaneous, you know, we can see RNA spontaneously forming itself in the laboratory. So we've got the, we can see that there are so certain elements that um, uh, are emerging, a complexity that is emerging from simply the, con the chemical constituents. And then eventually it allows a higher level of order and of information and of yeah of order really to emerge in terms of uh cells that can then divide and produce proteins and all the rest of it but this is getting very deep and is getting very far away from the brain <laughs> yeah uh, let's come back to the brain yeah. uh, you use the word meaning the, then the problem of meaning has two levels one is the meaning that a fruit fly has it has attraction towards certain things and it gets away from certain things. But humans have an another level of meaning. They know they have meaning. Yeah. So that oh, well. well, now we're getting on to, yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, I'm not really interested in humans <laughs> because we're so complicated. So, you know, I've spent my whole career, um, apart from, I spent three years studying humans uh, as a scientist after I'd finished my training. Um, and... The problem with humans is you can't kill them when the experiment goes wrong. So they're very difficult to work with because we're so clever. And so I, I abandoned that after three years and went back to what I'd initially studied, which was insects, because insects are much more tractable and much simpler. And yet we still don't understand them. So my overall, I mean, I am interested in, obviously, people are the most interesting thing there is. Don't get me wrong. You know, that's why I read novels and whatever. Um, but. I'm not sure that studying humans is the right way to start understanding how brains work or even how the mind works. I, when I was younger, I was very, um, uh, I was very dismissive of mind, uh, and I thought it was a uniquely human phenomenon, merely an epi, epi phenomenon of neuronal function, and was not terribly interesting uh, or tractable. I think that's wrong. Uh, partly on the Darwinian principle that there hasn't, in, in, if you look at the brains of humans and other animals, uh, closely related animals, it's very difficult. To, you know, there's nothing massively different. If you just look at the structure, it's made of the same stuff. It's got the same basic organization. Ours is a bit more complicated, but it's very, very similar. And I think uh, that would tend to suggest that Although there is there are qualitative differences between us and an ape, we're using some of them now. Language in particular, they can't do that. Um, there are uh, enough, plenty of reasons to think that there is something like thinking and mind in the head 
of a primate. And, you know, I'm now quite happy to use the word mind as a way of describing patterns of neuronal activity to refer to any nervous system. I, I've kind of, you know, I don't think it's, I've, I, think it, I think my initial fears were, or doubts about it were partly due to uh, precisely the kind of vitalist ideas that you were hinting at earlier on. So I, I think uh, if you want to understand mind, you need to uh, understand very simple systems in the same way as you want to understand how behavior and complexity can emerge out of nervous systems, then you need to understand properly, fully, and be able to model and predict the behavior of simple nervous systems. That I think could be wrong, but my hunch is that will provide rules uh, for nervous system function and its relation to behavior that can then be elaborated, amplified, and applied to um, and applied to uh, more complex nervous systems, other mam mammals, primates, and ultimately uh, ourselves. Sir, so, uh, to sum up, then you're saying that what differs, what the, the what differentiates us from the rock is just the organization from the atoms inside us. So what yeah. just we what what we have to study, although it's very it it. I mean, Bewildering complexity, but what we have to study is just the uh, just the organization. We have to come up with models in, in small, simple things and then scale them up. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing special about you know, there's nothing special about a living organism in terms of its molecular constituents. They are the, they're they're all around us. I mean, you know, bits of us were made in stars. You know, so it hasn't come from any. We haven't created it. Uh, we just stuck bits together, and you know, mainly we've eaten. And the stuff you eat turns into you. It's not. It's not magic. Um, so there's a that is indeed the challenge at any and it, it is enormously challenging at any level. It's how effectively quantity is turning into quality. You've got at some. I mean, and this is where to go back to your AI question. This is where the the you know the strong AI people would say you know we just build a com complicated enough computer. And being consciousness is going to pop up and it's then going to take over and kill us or whatever. I mean, it's certainly not going to want to be turned off. That's for sure. Uh, but I mean, I think that's nonsense. And it relates to I mean, things we don't understand about the organization of the brain. Now, we'll go back to the human brain. So, for example, we it's it's impossible for the moment to localize consciousness to any part of the brain. OK, so you can't say it's here or here or there. All attempts to identify a structure or even a network of structures as being the localization of consciousness have failed. And yet, for example, it's fairly clear that it almost certainly isn't in the cerebellum, which is in the back part of your brain, which is controlling. Well, one of the things it does, it does many things, but one of the things it does is to coordinate you to organize coordination and movement and all the rest of it. And the cerebellum has the most dense part of density of neurons in the whole of the brain. So if it's simply a matter of number of neurons and interconnections, and that's the kind of argument for the strong AI uh, people that eventually it, you know, consciousness is, will pop up when we're, you know, this is the stuff of science fiction, literally. You know, if you've seen the Terminator films, you know that it's the internet that eventually be Skynet eventually becomes conscious simply by that interconnection. Um, and then also masters time travel. But let's leave that to one side. Anyway, um, so that, that idea of complexity is simply going to lead to the emergence of, of intelligence and consciousness. In that case, you, you'd think that the cerebellum will be a very strong candidate for the localization of consciousness. And although we don't know where consciousness is, if it is any single place, it certainly is not in the cerebellum. That's all studies attempting to find a link between the cerebellum and consciousness have failed. It clearly isn't there. So simple complexity is not enough. Similarly, uh, there's something else going on. We don't know what it is. I mean, all the cells in your brain are all neurons. Well, there are a lot of glial cells which are wrapped around them and are doing all sorts of interesting things as well. But I mean, some people who get cross about, uh, in fact, who, who have a, 
uh, a Cartesian who think there is a mind, there is a separate spirit, non-physical mind. Uh, they say, well, look, they're all cells. How is it that uh, the brain cells produce matter, produce mind, whereas your muscle cells don't? I mean, nobody sells now, apart from your heart. <laughs> you don't think that, you don't think your are your biceps are thinking. They're just doing what they're just contracting. So, what is it about neurons? that is different from other cells. And that, that, that's interesting. And it's partly the interconnectivity and the uh, modu modulability, that is their activity can be modulated not only by outside stimuli, but by other connections with other neurons the, and the, the, the hormonal system in which they're bathing. But all that's partly true of, you know, ordinary cells in your liver or wherever. So there's, there, there's a big issue here, which I can't help to, I can't hope to, you know, I can't answer. And, you know, we are centuries away from finding an answer to those questions, I think. I mean, I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I hope next week it'll all be clear. I don't hope that the computers become consciousness conscious because I think they'll be very cross um, and they won't be they won't be social. They won't be loving. They won't be empathetic. All the things that we are because we are human, because we have evolved in that way. And that's essential to our being. We're social beings. We're not, you know, Ma rational maximizers out for our own individual interests. We work together. That's how we produce all this stuff by working together. It's not individuals. Uh, on the other hand, if my computer becomes conscious, I, I'm not sure it would have the same kind of. Well, it wouldn't. Wouldn't have the same understanding. You know, it wouldn't have the same morality as Darwin argued. Our morality too is built into our evolutionary past, and you can understand it there. But that's a whole different kettle of fish, I'm afraid. We're going to have to stop there. <laughs> on that note. Okay. I should stop the recording. Okay.